Well, welcome back to Ecclesiology 101. Thank you again for watching these videos. I apologize for the last two videos being a little longer than I intended them to be. So today we're going to try to shorten it up a little bit. And so I'm going to go really quickly, but I want to just remind you what we talked about last time. We talked about the affiliation and partnership that we have with the Southern Baptist Convention, the Baptist General Convention of Texas, and the Harmony Baptist uh, of the Harmony Pittsburgh Baptist Association. And uh, we talked a little bit about the cooperative program and how uh, we love the cooperative program because it helps us send the gospel all over the world in many different ways. You know, Baptists are really distinguished from other churches primarily because of our ecclesiology uh, convictions that we have. There are some people that, that like to say, well, I'm not Baptist or Presbyterian or uh, whatever, and I just want to be a Christian. And, and I get that. But it's impossible to do ministry without making some ecclesiological choices. For example, the church must decide on who can participate in the Lord's Supper. Uh, the church has to decide on who can be a member, uh, what officers that there will be in the church and what kind of government will the church have. And so perhaps no other doctrine has the practical application than that uh, as the doctrine of the church does. So if you're skeptical about denominational affiliations, I urge you to consider carefully what scripture says concerning the doctrine of the church. So with that, let's just jump right into it today. Uh, the church has two offices, and that is pastor and deacon. And within a congregational framework, the offices of a church shouldn't be um, uh, clergy and laity. That is a non-scriptural view of uh, ministers and pastors. Uh, it actually comes from the Catholic Church. There's no separation of Christians there. We are all Christians. Some happen to be officers of the church, either pastor or deacon. So what are some of the terms for pastor found in the New Testament? Well, there's three primary terms that we see, pastor, elder, and bishop. And all of these terms are interchangeable and mean almost exactly the same thing. 1 Peter 5, if you have your Bibles, you might want to turn there. 1 Peter 5, verses 1 through 5, and it'll be on the screen for you is probably the best example in all of the New Testament of the interchangeability of these terms, pastor, elder, and bishop. Uh, Peter writes, So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you. Exercise oversight not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Here we see three different terms and how they're interchangeable. And they speak to the duties of the pastor. What is a pastor supposed to do? And so I'm going to give you a list of uh, scripture passages. They'll be right there on your screen, but let me read them to you. Acts 20, 28 through 31. Romans 12, 8. Ephesians 4. 11 through 16, 1 Thessalonians 5, 12, 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7, 1 Timothy 5, 17, Titus 1, 5 through 9, Hebrews 13, 7, and 17, and then of course 1 Peter 5, 1 through 4, what we just read from. And I can, from these scripture passages, I think we see four primary functions of the pastor. Number one, and I think the foremost duty of a pastor, is being able to preach and teach the Word of God. 
Uh, that's why it says that all elders must be able to teach in 1 Timothy 3, 2, when uh, Paul is telling Timothy who a pastor should be, the characteristics of a pastor, that they should be able to teach. And then if you go over to Ephesians chapter 4, and you see these uh, apostles, evangelists, prophets, pastor, and teacher, you see these are gifts to the church. And that's why pastor and teacher, I believe, are combined, because that person must be a person of the word. And then if you jump over to Hebrews 13, 7, it says that, uh, that leaders, pastors, are those who spoke the word of God to you. So pastoral ministry must be the ministry of the word, plain and simple. Secondly, giving leadership to the church. Uh, this is what is referred to in 1 Timothy 5.17 as directing the affairs of the church. Um, leadership is also implied in the gift list listed in Romans 12.8, and it's also implied in the requirement that an elder be able to manage his own family well in 1 Timothy 3 verses 4 and 5. It is implied in the very word overseer, which is episkopos, and that means one who looks over, uh, that we just read from in 1 Peter. And you may also look up 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 and Hebrews 13, 17, when it talks about how the pastor and his leadership. Number three, shepherding the flock. While this includes feeding the flock the word of God and leading the flock, isn't that what a shepherd does, is feed and lead their flock to the best places? It's all, it also involves more personal ministry, individual counseling, training, ministries in times of grief and crisis, visitation of encouragement and admonition. Again, you can look up Acts 20, 28 through 31, 1 Thessalonians 5, 12, and 1 Peter 5, 2. And then fourth and finally, a pastor is an example of Christian character. When you read the two lists of characteristics of a pastor uh, in both Titus 1 and 1 Timothy 3, these are matters of character. These are qualities that every Christian is commanded to seek, but the pastor needs to take these characteristics to heart. They must show some progress uh, some maturity in these areas, and they have to have this level of spiritual maturity. And again, pastors are not perfect, but we must be an example to the flock. Next, are there qualifications for pastors? Well, there are, and it's found in 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7, and Titus 1, 5 through 9. And as you read that, those uh, qualifications and characteristics there, you'll notice that a pastor must uh, handle his marriage and his family life well. The husband of one wife, which may be best understood as, as a one-woman kind of man, uh, but he needs to be a man of conviction when it comes to his marriage. He must also be an example above reproach in managing, managing the household well, which indicates a divorced man cannot serve. And as you read these gifts or these characteristics, you'll notice that right underneath in 1 Timothy 3, it talks about deacons. And you'll notice that the big difference there is that an elder, pastor, bishop is one who is able to teach and manage well, but it does not say that for the deacon. And so how does one become a pastor? Well, first of all, uh, a man who wants to be in the ministry and pastor in any sort of way uh, must be called from God. And I see that there are three aspects to this calling of ministry. First of all, there must be an upward calling. God must issue the call to ministry. Paul himself tells us in 1 Timothy 2.7 that he was appointed a preacher and an apostle by God. In addition, Acts 20.28 20, states, Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among you, which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. As you can see here, uh, it says, Be on guard for yourselves and the flock, because the Holy Spirit has made you overseer. Second, there must be an inward call. 
The first words of the requirements for ministry listed in 1 Timothy 3, 1 provide the basis for the inward aspect of the call. It says, if any man aspires to the office of overseer, it is a fine work he desires. The word translated here as aspire means to stretch out in order to touch or to grasp or to desire something. The minister who answers the call of God must settle in his own mind what he desires. And uh, for years I ran from the ministry. I didn't want to be in the ministry, but uh, I heard that upward call, I felt that inward call, and then the church itself showed me that outward call. Uh, the outward call comes from the church. It includes the church, and, and, and it comes in licensing and ordination or in a church calling you to be a minister in its congregation. It's funny, one of the greatest preachers, he's called the Prince of Preachers, Charles Spurgeon, he did not like ordination, nor was he ordained. But he did say this to his students in his um, book, Lecture to My Students. Uh, Spurgeon wrote, The will of the Lord concerning pastors is made known through the prayerful judgment of his church. It is needful as a proof of your vocation that your preaching should be acceptable of the people of God. And so there are three calls, the upward call from God, the inward call from your, uh, that the Holy Spirit has put in a man to be a pastor, and then, of course, that uh, affirming call from the church. So how is a pastor selected? Well, you can turn over to Acts 6 and Acts 13, and this indicates that the congregation must be involved in the process of selecting a pastor. It's in keeping with the priesthood of all believers, and we'll talk more about that term in just a moment. Pastors, tenure, and number. Is there a certain number of pastors, and can a pastor stay for only so long? Well, in many churches today, uh, they have a plurality of elders where uh, there is an elder board with perhaps a lead or teaching elder. And uh, they would argue from Scripture that uh, this is what the New Testament church should look like. I personally believe in a, a uh, one leader, one pastor, and there can be more pastors, but not a plurality of, of leaders. And you'll understand why when we talk about the government of the church that I think such a thing. Scripture, though, does not require a minimum number or a maximum number. Uh, it can be one pastor or many pastors as long as they are all qualified and even in a plurality, you will find a leader among equals, as you find with perhaps even James in Scripture. So next, let's talk about deacons. How did the deacons come about? Well, their origin is found in Acts chapter 6. Uh, the, this is where we find deacons for the first time in the New Testament. While the word diakonos is not there, we see two other words, diakoneo and diakonia. Diakonos is one who serves, diakonia, and diakoneo means that person who is working, um, that is providing service to another. So what is the function of a deacon, and what are their responsibilities? Again, in Acts chapter 6, the function was to assist those responsible for leadership and the ministry of the Word of God and the unity of the, of the body of Christ. Uh, that's why we have deacons in the first place. Uh, there was a rift between some in the church, some people not getting enough food, uh, some uh, widows getting more food than others. And so the apostles, Peter and James and John and the others, said, let's pick out seven guys, seven men, uh, who can take care of this many, who can serve the church. And they were there to serve the church, serve their, the, the apostles, and to keep unity within the body of Christ. The, um, in the absence of any clearer indication in Scripture, um, the, there's an example that the fact that the diakonos simply means servant. Uh, it should point us to the idea that, that the main function of a deacon is to serve. They serve their pastor. They serve their 
their church membership. How do they do this? Well, in church membership, they can serve by doing some tasks around the house or uh, rides to the, the doctor's office, what have you, but they're there to serve. But they also serve pastors by taking on responsibilities that would consume us otherwise, uh, like taking people to the doctor or going and cleaning up someone's yards for them. Often, uh, a deacon involves uh, benevolence, uh, taking care of the grounds and property of the church, and anything else that could be delegated to them by the pastor. Uh, scripture seems to leave it very flexible to what the, the deacon's function is, and it really needs to meet the needs of each individual church and pastor. So do deacons have qualifications? Well, yes, they do. And they're found in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 8 through 13. Uh, they are to be similarly men of exemplary character, just like the pastor, including their marriage and family. They too should have some skill in management, but no gift of teaching or leadership is required. For none are needed to fulfill the deacon's responsibility of service. It would seem that the requirement they must first be tested is it parallels the requirement that the pastors too must first be tested to make sure that they're spiritually mature and not recent converts. So how do we select deacons? Well, again, you go back to Acts chapter 6. It seems to give the clearest guidance for us here. And that guidance seems to point to the congregational choice. Again, this is rendered difficult today because we have so many unregenerate or woefully immature church members. And so uh, the, the church, though, does have a voice in those men who are chosen to be deacons. And do deacons, is there a certain number of deacons a church must have or the tenure that they must serve? Well, there's no guidelines spelled out in all of Scripture. The number would be limited of necessity by those who meet the qualifications. It should not be more than are necessary to carry out the functions and roles that are assigned to them. And while scripture says nothing about any limitation of tenure, it seems maybe for some that it um, might be wise to, to not have someone be a deacon forever. Once you're ordained, you are a deacon forever. But maybe take a break from serving from time to time to replenish and help your own spiritual maturity. But none of that is prohibited or um, governed by anything that we can find in the scripture. So we talked about the officers of the church, the pastor and the deacon. And what about the government of the church? Now, there are some groups or denominations that have tried to minimize the need for church government. But scripture shows evidence for church government, uh, shows evidence for church membership, regular meetings, and enforcing order within the church. Uh, with that in mind, there are three types of governments uh, or ways that the church governs itself. Uh, the first is the Episcopalian style. This type of government is known by the use of a bishop. That word is episkopos in Greek, and it means overseer. In this system, the ultimate power of government rests in the hands of the bishop or the bishops. Uh, that is not our form of government. Second is the Presbyterian form of government with elders. Uh, that The Greek word is presbyteros. This involves a secession of bodies. The local church is governed by a it's called a session. These are elders selected by the congregation, and sometimes they're called ruling elders and or teaching elders. Um, again, this is not the way that Hollybrook is governed. The way that we're governed is congregationalism. It's the government by congregation. All members of the local congregation are the final human authority for that church. They may elect leaders, but these are servant leaders, most often called pastors and deacons. The congregation may delegate certain decisions, but maintains the final authority on things. This model adheres to local church autonomy, meaning nobody higher than the local church can interfere with its working. 
And let me just give you a few verses to, uh, to speak to congregationalism. Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. Acts chapter 11, verse 22. Acts chapter 11, 29 through 30. Acts 13, 1 through 3. Acts 15, 1 through 3. 1 Corinthians 5, 4 through 7. 1 Corinthians 14, 26 through 40. And 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2. These all show lo local congregations acting to govern themselves in the order of the affairs within the church. Congregationalism rests on the priesthood of all believers. In 1 Peter 2, we read, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. All believers are indwelt by the Holy Spirit and can receive guidance from the Lord. But we need to be careful and we need to use caution when we talk about any sort of congregationalism, which I am 100% uh, for, uh, for. But this presupposes that every member in the local congregation are regenerate and walking with the Lord and the Holy Spirit. And so it, it assumes that every member of the church is a born-again believer of Christ. And unfortunately, in the church today, we have, uh, in churches all over America, people who are not born again, who have not truly been converted or regenerated in Christ. And many Baptist churches today are turning to that Presbyterian type, that Presbyteros kind of rule, where it's an elder rule because unregenerate people have infiltrated church membership and has changed the way that church uh, looks at certain uh, actions and functions and government within the, the local body. Scripturally, uh, you can see the autonomy of the local church is, number one, the lordship of Jesus over the local church. Uh, the closest uh, that anyone can go toward con congregationalism is, is voluntarily. Uh, it's non-coercive. Uh, it, it's what puts us together and brings us together as a body believer. Those of us who are regenerate, born-again believers, we come together as a congregation. And we acknowledge that God has seen fit to bless our church using uh, maybe all three of these forms of government down throughout history, but the congregational form adheres the closest to the biblical witness. And then lastly, we'll talk about requirements for church membership. And it's important to know the requirements for church membership because it, it has a lot to do with the way that the church uh, is governed in congregationalism. First, there is a moral requirement, which is regeneration or being born again. Immediately upon salvation, you enter the kingdom of God, the future assembly that we've talked about and what is commonly referred to the universal church, the moment a person trusts in Christ, they are born again, and they are part of the universal church. Um, but there also has to be this inward decision when you accept Christ, and, and you are regenerate, uh, justified. You also need to find your place in a local church. Here at Hollybrook and most Southern Baptist churches, there are two requirements to become a member. First is regeneration, truly being born again, accepting Christ as the only way for salvation. And then the second is by believers' baptism, by immersion. Scripture is clear that one has to be born again in order to join a local church. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 1, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. See what it says? Only believers can be sanctified. Those 
Sanctification, of course, is every day we're becoming a little more like Jesus. So only sanctified people, those who are becoming more like Jesus, can actually uh, uh, meet the qualifications for church membership. And you see what it says? We are called to be saints. A saint is a synonym a synonym for one who has trusted in Jesus, a believer in Jesus Christ. And those who call upon the name of Jesus, guess what? We are saved by Jesus. And that's how I want to end today. Thank you for listening. And, and I just want to make sure you know that you are saved by Jesus. Have you put your faith in him alone for your salvation, for your eternal life? If not, I'd love to have a chat with you. God bless, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.